So um, today I'm going to be looking at very local sites to where I'm currently living at the moment, which is in East Anglia. I'm from Cambridge myself, um, and I've been studying especially the landscape around the Wandlebury region, uh, to, over Cherry Hinton where I, I lived for many years, and also down now into Essex where I'm currently living in North Essex in a place called Colne Engain. And there's a surprising amount of megalithic sites in that area. It really is quite stunning. Uh, I actually moved to Glastonbury about nine years ago uh, to sort of study the ancient landscape, uh, to look into earth mysteries and landscape zodiacs and such things. And after a few years, I realised actually my home landscape of East Anglia is where it's all happening as well. It's not just in the West Country. And so this is just a, an amalgamation of some of the research I've done there. We're going to have a look at the Wandlebury complex, which is absolutely fascinating. Well known because the Mary Energy Line goes through it, uh, which is, became popular in The Sun and the Serpent by Paul Broadhurst and Hamish Miller. But also because of this famous Loxodrone alignment uh, that Christian O'Brien uh, discovered in the 1970s. And you can see a picture of him here with one of the stones that is actually on the alignment. And um, we're going to be looking at various different subjects, but fundamentally, the thing about East Anglia is that it's not well known for megalithic sites or ancient sites. The only thing that really pops into people's minds is Sea Henge that I've discovered at home on sea up on the Norfolk coast. But there's nothing really that stands out. This is why I think this area needs a second look, and this is what we're going to be doing this morning. This is just some of the things we're going to look through in the next hour. Um, especially the Gog Magog hills around uh, south southeast of Cambridge where the Wandlebury uh, site sits but where many other sites are in that whole region and it's recently been announced been announced by archaeologists by the head Cambridge archaeologist that they believe it's now a neolithic ritual landscape and it's much more than just the Wandlebury so-called iron age hill fort which they used to call it um, obviously, we're going to have a look at the Loxodrome alignment, uh, some of the earthworks and megaliths in the area. We've also got the Ickneald Way that goes through this area, which stretches all the way down and joins up with the Ridgeway and comes down to Avebury and even further southwest. Uh, there's many of the stones seem to mark these trackways, and as uh, the researcher Tony Charlton is actually here, uh, there's the Puddingstone Track that goes through East Anglia and Essex and Suffolk. Um, and we're going to have a quick look at the Michael and Mary lines to see where they go through the region as well. And uh, there are amazing simil similarities and correlations with the Avebury landscape, uh, as we'll see as we go through the talk. And we have to really ask, you know, were the megalith builders at Wandlebury? And did they actually bring many of these sarsen stones from the West Country? Let's start at the Gog Magog Hills. There's a lot of interesting legends about the Gog Magog Hills. And these are the pretty much the highest part of Cambridge. And they only go a couple of hundred feet high, to be honest with you, because um, it's obviously a fairly flat place. But there's been some interesting references going a long way back, and the Gog Magog name often brings a lot of questions about it uh, because of the biblical references and the nature that they may have been giants with the whole Brutus tradition um, down in Totnes and other places. Um, but this name seems to have stuck, and the relation to giants is very interesting because just on the base of the Gog Magog Hills in Cherry Hinton is a place called Giant's Grave, uh, which is a natural spring. And on top of the Gog Magog Hills, uh, there's another circular earthwork similar to Wandlebury, which has now been uh, fully destroyed uh, by the water company up on Lime Kiln Hill. It was a place called that they named the War Ditches. And it was a similar earthwork, it's like a circular earthwork, it had lots of tumuli scattered all over that part of the hills. <laughs> But they found in the late 1800s and early 1900s some skeletons there that were of extreme height, some of them between seven and eight feet tall, according to the reports. Um, now, Michelle Bullivant, she's a local archaeologist there, and we've been sort of on a little mission to try and find any remnants of any of these skeletons sort of to prove this point. She believes they were possibly from the early Bronze Age or even late Neolithic, because many of the finds up on the Gog Magog Hill seem to stretch that far. And so the legends of the Gog Magogs could have come from that, that perhaps a race of very tall people or giants lived there. Uh, and also next to the giant's grave in uh, Cherry Hinton, we have the Robin Hood and Little John pub, uh, which is uh, obviously Little John was a giant. And this is actually a stone that is actually in the pub car park. 
Um, and interestingly, it's ne next to Gladstone Way, which is uh, something that Alfred Watkins picked up on throughout his early research, that the name, street names often give clues to the nature uh, of the ancient parts of um, these particular places. This is the actual, on the bottom right here, this is the actual spring, the natural spring. And Michelle Bullivant, the archaeologist, has actually believes there was tumulus built within here. There's very strange earthworks just around the edge of it. This is the, the famous stone, which has now been named the Kingship Stone because of this footmark which is in it. Um, and no one's really been able to sort of work out how this got in there because it, I've got some other photos later on, I think, in the talk. But that's, that's about a size 10 or 11 footmark. And there's traditions stretched throughout Britain and Europe which suggest when feet were placed in certain stones, it became like a toot or a king site, and it was where the, the, the kings or the tribal leaders would proclaim their vows and laws from that particular place. And this is right at the base of the Gog Magog Hills, where these so-called giants used to live. And all around these hills, there's many, many different sites and discoveries that are currently being made. So the suggestion is, is that this was actually like um, an ancient sacred kind of complex of a whole tribe lived around. And this is just starting to come to the fore now. This is the stone actually at uh, Gladstone Way. This is the second stone, just about 100 yards from the other one. Uh, and this is a sarsen that's stuck into the ground there. Um, but we've not, we've not really had a chance. We haven't got permission from the, uh, the person who lives there to dig it out just yet. Uh, but that may happen, um, maybe in the dead of night with balaclavas. Um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, we're just jumping back here to the, some of the, this is just some of the references to Gog and Magog. Um, I'm not going to read through all these, but you can have a quick look yourself. But this, I think this part down here really interests me. Uh, this is some of the decipherment that Christian O'Brien did in his early research in 1976 about the Wandlebury complex. Uh, and he believes that the Og and Gog are the same thing, and often the G is lost uh, from uh, what in ancient pronunciations of this particular word. And so he believes Gog and Magog was actually part of uh, the Tuatha Dí Danann, the Irish tradition, and they actually came over to Wandlebury and built many of the ancient sites and, and placed the megaliths in this part of the country. Uh, so I find this interesting that he believes that some uh, different variations of Ogma, Ogma of the Sun Countenance, and Ogma of Sun Learning, or the Sun Sage. So this is like a reference to observing the sun at different times of year. And as we look at Wandlebury, we'll see that there are alignments cut into the outer bank at Wandlebury, which mark the solstices and equinoxes, and even the moon rises and moon sets over a 19-year uh, cycle. This is just a basic map of Wandlebury, and you can see the perfectly circular nature of it. Um, here's the main entrance down here, but they believe uh, but there's lots of notches. You can see them here that, that O'Brien believes were actually alignments when measured from the centre here, and uh, make observations of the sun, moon, and even the stars. Technically, or classically, it's called an Iron Age hill fort. Now, this is just a name given to it, because some of the finds there, they believe, are Iron Age. But since then, there's been a few other finds and archaeological digs which have uncovered artifacts from the Bronze Age. But specifically, which most interests me, is from the Neolithic era. There was a, a very heavy Neolithic settlement just along the next field along from where Wandlebury was then built. Uh, and it's got several different stages uh, to the construction of Wandlebury. Uh, it believe, they believe it began around 500 BC and was rebuilt around 200 BC. However, when O'Brien looked at, looked at this, he, he just couldn't believe that because it could have easily been built a lot earlier and just reconstructed at 500 BC by the Iron Age people. It was possibly the Iceni because Boudicca or Bodicea was supposed to uh, be in this, this area as well. Um, so, and, and such a small amount of it has actually been excavated. There's only a small area here, and a small area down here, and a patch around there that's actually been excavated, because the rest of it's been built on uh, by Lord Godolphin in the 1700s. Um, and so, such a small amount of it has been excavated, it's really hard to analyse and date this particular site. And this is really, sort of stresses out the archaeologists. But when you have open-minded archaeologists such as Mark Hinman and Michelle Bullivan, it really gives a whole other dimension to this and actually allows um, the knowledge to start coming out in a more, um, more refined manner. Famously, Tom Lethbridge in the 1950s 
discovered what he believed to be a Chalk Hill figure at the site as well. Now, this is just on the south-facing uh, slope that goes uh, just away, just, just outside the main ring. And this is what he believes he uncovered, and this is his analysis of what probably the whole thing looked like. And he had this unusual method.